This seminar is um, going to be a bit different from the other seminars that we typically have um, at the centre. This isn't necessarily about one particular research project or um, research theme. Um, it's more about the ways in which four of us um, as a collective with different research interests have worked um, to, over the course of the last 12 to 18 months, in advancing some of the um, environmental modelling activities that we do at CORE. And I thought, um, given that we've recently purchased, or within the last year, purchased a, a, a new piece of kit and been able to do some, some interesting um, new work that we weren't able to do before, it's a nice opportunity to um, share this with the rest of the centre and people that are, don't necessarily work with these models. So as I mentioned in, in the email yesterday, there's no prerequisite for any knowledge whatsoever um, on uh, modelling or, or computing. Um, I'm hoping this is um, the themes are accessible to um, everyone. Um, and I should say one of the things that I found when I've been putting this together is that I don't know quite as much about this stuff as I thought I did um, about modelling and about research computing. So it's been kind of eye-opening for me as well to think about ways of explaining these sorts of ideas in an understandable and digestible way. Um, so it's not, there's not going to be a, a great introduction to modelling or modelling philosophy, that kind of thing. That's not what I'm, I'm here to do today. Um, but I will talk about the, the activities that we're, um, that we're involved in here at CORE, uh, some of the challenges in research computing in general, um, and then the ways in which we've made advancements in our c capability here at CORE. Um, and then towards the end, I'll talk about some of the recent research projects that the four of us and the, the people working within our um, group um, have been working on, and a quick summary at the end. Um, so I would hope that we can all agree that responding to environmental change is certainly amongst the 21st century's most important global challenges. Um, the use of models is very important within the fundamental processes and resilience theme in aiding our understanding of the processes underpinning a variety of environmental systems. Um, and we focus on climate, hydrology, geomorphology and ecology. And that's probably, um, those topics reflect the, the people who are working at CORE. It's not necessarily an exhaustive list and I'm sure that it will change um, over the course of time. But um, in climate modelling we're looking, and we, we work frequently on this myself and Bastian and, and, and PhD students, the analysis and evaluation of, of many of the state-of-the-art um, climate model simulations that are used to generate um, the global scenarios that many of us are using in, in all sorts of different fields. In hydrology, we're modelling the movement, the distribution, the quality of water in order to aid our capacity to, to predict, to understand and to ultimately manage water resources better. Um, Ecological modelling, which is something that uh, Martin Wilkes is heavily involved in, um, is about the construction and analysis of models, usually mathematical models, both biological and biophysical, um, to represent ecological processes. Uh, and then in geomorphological modelling, which is led by Marco, um, this is about enhancing the understanding um, of earth surface processes and landforms. So that's kind of the, the collection of activities um, by no means is this an exhaustive list, but it's what we as individuals are working on at the moment. And I guess a centre is always going to be um, dictated by the research interests of the people that are working there. Um, just to make the distinction between numerical and statistical modelling, um, or the, the distinction as I see it, I guess. So numerical modelling, we're thinking about using mathematics, using mathematics to represent fundamental equations that describe um, the physics of a particular system. Um, and particularly how uh, the system changes from one state to another. Um, and there's lots of interdependence between different factors uh, within an environmental system, and this is um, results in potentially quite complex models uh, and complex solutions to solving problems. In statistical modelling, this is more about um, maybe estimating how the system is likely to change over the course of time. And we're also using um, statistical algorithms um, in 
response to some of the output that we get from numerical modeling. So just to illustrate that there's often a significant overlap in our numerical modeling activities and our statistical modeling activities. Um, but all of these activities, whatever the, um, the, the task or the, the field of, of research that we're interested in, the one thing that's common is that we need advanced computing resources, maybe not anything quite as grand as the supercomputer there on the right. But the point is that in order to um, undertake these activities, we need something a little, a little bit more sophisticated than a desktop or a laptop computer. Um, and there's two major challenges in, in research computing. Obviously, there's many, many challenges, but the two challenges that are um, common to pretty much everyone working in this, these sorts of fields, two limitations, um, computational capacity and storage capacity. And I'll talk about these two things separately, starting with um, computational capacity. So if we think about this, and again, I'm, I think given that this is a, a relatively small group, if you don't understand anything or you think I'm not making any sense, then please put your hand up. But I'm, I'm trying to think in as simplistic terms as possible. If we have um, a particular task that we want to run, whether that's um, a program to produce some form of output, that program goes into some form of process um, on a computer. So if we consider this to be um, a processor in a, in a computer, whether that's a laptop or a larger computer, and then we're producing an output. Okay. So the point here is that we can only do one task at a time if we only have one processor. So potentially there are lots of different tasks. You might want to run a simulation many, many times and, and tweak it slightly along the way or run a statistical model um, for lots of different locations. But you can only do this one at a time, okay? So there's a queue of tasks um, before that. And as, as we go, once the process is finished, an output is produced, and then the queue can move along and until finally all the tasks are done. Um, in multiprocessing, we take advantage potentially of there being more than one processor. So most of, most of us, Certainly, my MacBook has uh, four processors in it. So in principle, I could distribute the tasks that I have to four different processors. You might want to leave one just to deal with the, the running of the computer, but you may have another three that, um, that can be used to run lots of similar tasks that are able to run simultaneously and independently. And obviously, sending a bunch of tasks to four different processors and producing output, we're getting through that, that queue of jobs much more quickly. So in, in principle, at least, this is going to be four times as, as fast as, as just using a, um, a single processor. So this is what we refer to as multiprocessing or capacity computing. And it's not quite as sophisticated as the alternative way of using multiple processors, which is capability computing, also known as parallel computing, in which multiple processors, in this case we've had the same four processors, but these are being used together to deal with one larger task, one more complex task. And this means that the four processors, in this case, um, are doing calculations um, simultaneously, but dependent on each other. So there has to be communication within um, the processors that are working on the task. And just to give some real world examples of the type of when we would use parallel computing versus multiprocessing. Um, and I'll, because I'm, as you know, most of you know, I'm uh, from a climate background. Um, uh, so naturally, I uh, use all my examples from, from climate modeling and the things that, that I'm working on, the things that Bastian's working on. Um, so this is just a, a representation of what we would include in a climate model. So this is a representation of um, the atmosphere, um, the ocean, the land surface, and importantly, the interactions between them. So the interactions might be heat exchange, um, evaporation, um, rainfall, um, heat exchanges, uh, exchanges with both the land and the sea. So there's lots and lots of processes here that are happening together. Um, and this is why it becomes a very complex task and the, the kind of thing that we would want to use parallel computing for. Um, in the example here, I'm using four processors, but um, 
in reality, you may be running that on several hundred processors, maybe in the order of a thousand or so. Um, a different example where we might use multiprocessing, and I'm going to talk about my, my own work here for a second. This is an example of quantifying trends in extreme rainfall uh, in the Netherlands, which is um, where I used to work. So here we've got annual rainfall maxima at many points around the country, and these were fitted to a statistical model. You don't need to know the details necessarily, but fitted to a statistical model in order to understand how the likelihood of extreme rainfall has changed due to global warming. Uh, and when we feed all of these things, all of these data points into a statistical model, we are able to conclude that extreme events are four times as likely now compared to the pre-industrial era. So we have a warming, um, uh, a warming atmosphere associated with rising um, global surface temperatures that gives a greater moisture carrying capacity in the atmosphere. That's why we have more extreme rainfall events. So this is, a, this is a clear statement, but how confident are we in this statement? Is it statistically significant? Well, we only have these data points to work with. So instead, what we can do is to take, rather than all of the data points, a sample of those data points, fit it to the same statistical model. Um, and this time, we might find that the event is maybe three times as likely. Uh, and we run another sample, and we might find that it's five and a half times as likely. So very dependent on precisely which data points we add in. After we've done maybe a thousand samples, we can be usually quite confident in the, in the range of uncertainty, but this is obviously quite time consuming. Um, so consider that maybe if, the, if you're running this on a laptop that's capable of fitting a statistical model in a few seconds or maybe under a minute, um, the sampling of doing this a thousand times would still take several hours. It's still quite an arduous process. Um, so after we run a thousand samples in this instance, we find that whilst our original statement was that we have a, what's known as a probability ratio of four, which means four times as likely, this is actually with, within a, a confidence interval range of around 1.5 to 18. So that's quite large and probably um, our original statement of uh, four times as likely is not um, particularly truthful, we have to represent the, the uncertainty. So this is according to observations. We also ran the same thing for, for different sets of climate models. Um, and yes, the midway points here broadly represent what we get if we add in all the data and then the sampling is the, the width of the bar. Um, but we find because with the models, the uncertainty includes both uh, negative and no change, that none of the model trends are statistically significant. This is very useful to know. I won't go into details, please read the paper. Um, but it's very time consuming to do because we're running thousands of samples, lots of different models, lots of different ensemble members. This is an example where multiprocessing becomes very useful because the programs used to fit the model are very small um, and don't take up much time. They're very simple. It's just that there's loads of them. Okay, so if you can distribute this off, in this example, four, but potentially uh, 20, 50, 100 different processes, you can get through um, this quantification of uncertainty quite quickly. So they're the two ways in which we can use machines with um, multiple processes. The second great limitation is storage capacity, storing our data, making it um, access easily, easy to, to access, easy to transfer, easy to share amongst different users. Uh, again, I'll use an example in climate models just to try and help you to understand where we get the volume of data from and why. Um, so this is sort of a, a cutaway of what a climate model might look like. A climate model is made up of, um, of grid cells and then three-dimensional grid boxes, and we get potentially one value for, for each of those boxes, and we have control over what the resolution will be. So that's just an example. But the data is expressed in, in four dimensions. Obviously, we have longitude and latitude. We also have height or pressure level, so that's our three-dimensional space. And then we also have a fourth dimension, which is time. Um, and for a typical model, we might have 
um, output files that are usually generated for, for each month in the, the model time. Output is provided at typically every six hours, so you might have 120 time steps in the month. Okay. Um, horizontally, if we're having a, a grid cell resolution of 200 by 200 kilometers, that equates to around um, 18,000 grid cells over the surface of the Earth. But we also have 31 levels in the atmosphere, so it's, it's this number multiplied by 31. Potentially, the climate model is, is simulating around 100 different variables, and this gives us almost 7 billion data elements. This is just within one monthly file. So the size of the file for one month at this resolution is around one gigabyte, which is 1,000 megabytes. Um, 200 by 200 is not... Um, typical of, of um, the climate models used um, currently. It's quite, quite a coarse resolution, quite a low resolution. So this is what happens if we try and increase the resolution. So 200 by 200 kilometers is not especially useful when we want to look at things like rainfall that have great spatial variability. So this is, um, uh, I'm just looking at the date that says 2008 on it which is how long I've been using this figure for. Um, so just, just to demonstrate, obviously, I think most of us know that um, in the UK, it's much wetter in the, the northwest than in the southeast. And we had the, the Pennines going through the spine of, of England. It's far wetter on the, on the west than on the east. But a climate model would provide just one value for this entire region, so it would miss all of that variability. So we might want to um, increase the resolution by a factor of two. Um, so instead of 200 kilometer grid cells, we might go to 100 kilometer grid cells. So this is increasing by a factor of two, but we have to do this in all four dimensions. So we obviously get four, instead of one value for the surface, we might get four, which is great. But we also have, we also have to reduce, uh, increase the resolution by a factor of two vertically as well, and then also in time. So we're having to increase it by two to the power of four, which is 16. So even by having um, climate model output of 100 kilometers, this is giving us an output file of around 16 gigabytes, which is starting to get quite large. And if we, reduce, if we increase the resolution further, say to 50 kilometers, we now have, um, so this is a factor of four, but it's four to the power of four, which is 256 times as many data points. So one output file potentially becomes 256 gigabytes, and this is where it starts to become completely unmanageable. Um, if you consider that the, um, the total storage capacity of my laptop is only 128, I've, clearly I, I can't do anything with this file on my own machine. Um, we've talked a little bit, I've tripped down memory lane now, um, so not, not just data storage, but also the idea of portable data storage, ways of, of transferring files, being able to share them. Um, and yeah, showing my age a little bit, because I remember my uh, first day uh, as an undergraduate in 2001, 250 geography students in Birmingham being handed a floppy disk each, a complimentary floppy disk, as if to say, this is for all your files, this is all you'll need. Um, 1.44. I'd like to think there are some people who don't know what this is. I don't know, Laura, you're quite young. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yes. Uh, in my second year, I started a, a GIS module, um, with, which meant dealing with really large data files. Uh, we were told that we could purchase one of these. This is a zip disk. Have you ever seen these things? So they look like floppy disks, but um, between 100 and 250 uh, megabytes. So being told that you can you can buy this disk for whatever inflated price it was being sold for, fifteen pounds maybe, um, and told that this had the capacity of a hundred floppy disks, everyone was like, "Oh, this is amazing! Got to get one of these." Until he discovered that um, only a handful of the computers on campus actually had a drive in which to insert one of these disks. So not only did you have to buy the disk, you needed to buy the drive as well, um, and find somewhere to plug that in on the back of your computer. But thankfully. These things didn't last long um, and re replaced by the things like the, um, the pen drive, the USB device, um, a capacity maybe of upwards of one gigabyte, so a thousand floppy disks. 
still not enough for most of us. So we find ourselves, and increasingly this is one of the problems we, we find when we're working with large data is that we have potentially multiple external hard drives for dealing with large amounts of data. Um, and it doesn't really matter. All of these things come from the same family. They're all suffering the same problem. I mean, we've all experienced issues from, I'm sure, from damaged disk drives, losing these things. Um, the difficulty potentially in sharing large amounts of data between multiple users. And ultimately, there is never enough storage. You always want more. So um, I'll move on now to talking. I've explained what some of the problems are. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we tried to improve the situation for ourselves uh, in our group and working in these um, four um, research fields. So specifically, what are the limitations that hinder our research at core? And how can we address these limitations within our, our own research environment? Um, so if we think first of all about what we, what we have at core and what we use and where that features on um, a two-dimensional grid, computational capacity versus storage capacity, so those two limitations. Uh, each of us working with models, we obviously we're using our desktop machines and our laptops um, on a daily basis. They might have between two and four cores each, um, which is potentially useful, but not really a solution if we're looking to do multiple processing. Um, 512 to maybe half a terabyte of storage each. Uh, mine is certainly a smaller one. Um, but at core, we also have something in the middle, something um, of greater computational capacity and much more storage in the numerical computation suite, which also serves as, as Marco's office. Um, there are two um, uh, reasonably high spec machines with 28 cores each and three terabytes of um, data storage capacity. Um, and these each have graphical processing units because they were ultimately purchased by Marco in order to um, do a lot of geomorphological um, modeling, landform simulations, and also visualization of, of what the model is producing. So not necessarily just looking at numbers, but actually looking at um, a 3D image. Um, over the course of time, um, Bastian came along and decided that he wanted a slice of these um, machines. So um, managed to log in and, and began using them for, for doing all sorts of data processing. Um, then maybe Musa came along <laughs> and wanted to do the same thing. Uh, and then me. So gradually, many, other, many more people working on models have, have been relying on these machines. And that's not necessarily what they were intended for in the first place. So we were thinking about, surely there's something else we can make it the next step now. We can find something that fits somewhere down there with greater computational capacity and greater storage capacity that doesn't impede what's being done in the numerical computation suite. So um, last year, we purchased uh, a, a new facility. So this came from the university's uh, research equipment round where uh, make a case for, for purchasing new equipment. And uh, this was funded mostly by that scheme and in part by Core as well. Uh, and this is a new server for research computing, which is named um, Proteus. Uh, Proteus was a, um, a sea god or a god of rivers and large bodies of water, I think, in, in early Greek mythology. So keeping within this water theme that dominates the, the work that we're doing. Um, so um, Pro Proteus was a shape-shifting god, so he could take many forms. So the verb protein, protein uh, means to be versatile and adaptable, which is quite a nice fit for hopefully what this computer is going to be used for. Uh, in reality, it looks like that. Um, it's 128 cores and 83 terabytes of usable storage, so significantly larger than anything that we have currently. Um, and it sits down there in, in our matrix, I guess, of, of, of computing power. And it's meant that a lot of the activities that previously we were directing to the numerical computation suite, we can now direct to, to Proteus. OK, so simulations uh, or experiments that uh, myself and Bastian are, are carrying out and, and also data analysis. Uh, Martin's been using this quite heavily. But it's meant that 
Marco can go back to using the numerical computation suite for the um, uh, for what it was intended for in the first place, uh, which is largely about visualization and, uh, and landform simulation. Just to point out, just to be clear, obviously the desktop machines and the laptops also what we have in the numerical compu computation suite. This is all housed in core, so this is something. This is things that we have control over, uh, that we're responsible for. Proteus is housed by IT services. Um, I've never. I've never actually seen it. I ob I've obviously bought it and I arranged the acquisition. And then I don't even know where it is. It's in a, <laughs> in a room on, uh, somewhere on campus. But obviously, if anything went wrong with the, with the hardware or anything, that would be taken care of by people that um, know more about these things than I do. OK. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on now to the sort of second part of, of the talk in which I'm going to showcase, and I, I keep using that word, <laughs> showcase some of the current research that we've been doing, um, starting off with some of um, the climate work. Um, so I've been working on a project um, since, well, I've been involved in this, uh, this work since my, my previous position came to an end in, in the Netherlands. Um, so this is about forecasting forest fire danger on seasonal timescales specifically for the boreal forests of the northern hemisphere. So this constitutes uh, around a third of the world's forests um, and the fires or, or what's burnt is around 12% of the, of the global biomass that's burnt on an annual basis. It's a major factor in ecosystem dynamics and changes in what we call the sub-annual fire regime. So Fires occurring on, on monthly to seasonal timescales um, have massive impacts on, on various parts of the forest ecology. So the challenge here, um, a two-part challenge, I guess. The, the link, first of all, between fire activity and large-scale climate drivers is not, uh, not necessarily always very clear. Um, forecasting fire danger is typically done uh, at daily timescales, the timescales that we associate with, with our day-to-day -day weather forecasts. Um, but being able to make predictions on monthly to seasonal timescales is very important for forest management and particularly in large countries um, of low population density like Russia, like Canada, the distribution of resources during the fire season. So the project um, that I was involved in and I'm sort of part involved in now is aiming to address these challenges, the pre-real project. Um, so what I worked on was um, making predictions of seasonal uh, temperature and rainfall across the world in order to generate, of, well, across the, ro the world in terms of that's where the predictions are done for. But then we're generating something called the monthly drought code, which is a, uh, an indicator for fire danger in, in the northern hemisphere forests. Um, and we find that the forecasts are reasonably highly correlated with um, satellite um, observations of, of burned area averages over the um, over the boreal domain. What we've been able to do since having uh, Proteus is to ask the question to what extent are individual fires associated with, with particularly high forecasts. So the increased computing capacity has allowed us to take a database of 160,000 fires for a 12-year period and then match these with the corresponding forecast. So the grey dots that you see here are examples of, of fires that have occurred. And then we can also look at the corresponding forecast. So where it's red, the forecast is above the 75th percentile. Um, where it's orange, it's above the, the median. Um, so without going into too much detail, the paper's just been submitted, but there's strong potential for for this particular indicator, uh, sorry, for this particular type of forecast to be quite informative on those longer timescales for which there's a gap at the moment. And we find that at least two thirds of the largest fires, so those that are greater than a thousand hectares, are associated with high risk forecasts. Um, moving on to something else then, um, something that Bastian's been working on. Um, so this is about understanding variability in global uh, rainfall patterns. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the phenomenon known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or, or ENSO. This is a naturally occurring 
um, fluctuation in the uh, sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. And positive phases, or what's known as El Nino, is associated with um, wetter or drier than average conditions in large parts of the world. These are what's known as teleconnections. When ENSO is in a negative phase or a La Nina, um, we get something largely reversed, if that makes sense. Um, but the challenge here is that to ask the question, to, to what extent does this variability, which takes place um, between three and seven years on average, that's the, the wavelength of these um, uh, positive and negative phases, how does ENSO interact with um, other modes of variability that potentially are on longer time scales? So that's something that Bastian is particularly interested in. Um, so what's been looked at already is uh, the agreement between um, different observational data sets, different sea surface temperature data sets, to see whether um, patterns of interannual and decadal variability are shared amongst different data sets. Having Proteus now allows us to extend this analysis to a range of state-of-the-art climate models. So there isn't just one climate model that we work on, there's maybe between 20 and, and 30 um, that we rely upon for our um, climate scenarios around the world. Um, so in terms of the impact on rainfall, there is a significant impact on the way decadal fluctuations can modify the strength or the extent of a particular ENSO phase. Um, this is something that's in preparation. I know I've glossed over that, and I know you'd love to talk about it in more detail um, <laughs> another time. <laughs> okay, so in ecology then, uh, Martin Wilkes, who may be watching, he may not, <laughs> um, he's in Indonesia at the moment, uh, two projects, the first of which is about quantifying genetic uh, diversity. So we typically think of, of biodiversity as, as being expressed by the number or the abundance of particular types of species in a particular area. Um, genetic diversity is another way of expressing biodiversity, essentially. Um, the major taxonomic groups are very diverse. It's very difficult to make um, calculations of genetic diversity. Um, typically they might be obtained for a small number of species with the relationships organised in what's known as a phylogenetic tree. Um, so Martin has downloaded um, a gene database of 2,700 invertebrate species um, and then looked to align these genes and then to look at the branch lengths of a phylogenetic tree using two particular algorithms, this clustal Omega and Mr. Bay's algorithm. Um, the problem here is that these two algorithms are, are way too computationally intensive to use on such a high number of species with standard hardware. Um, but Proteus has, has given Martin the capacity to go out and, and make this incredible. And this is incredibly detailed. This is what ma is making the, the PowerPoint file size so big, I think. Um, so this is a full tree that has over 2,700 species in 15 major invertebrate orders. And given that he's put an exclamation mark at the end of that sentence, that would suggest that that's pretty impressive. <coughs> Not my field of expertise. Uh, so this, this work is in preparation. Um, it's now possible to, to identify or quantify uh, genetic diversity for this very important group, and not just um, in one particular location, but all across Europe. Um, and this is being used now to, to address fundamental questions in ecology and evolution. And the fact that we can do this kind of analysis um, here, the fact that we're leading it, is, is particularly impressive, I think. Um, another thing that Martin's been working on uh, is processes of community assembly. So it's well known um, that climate and land use changes are driving uh, species extinction and, and changes in community structure. Um, but one question is to what extent are, uh, is the loss of biodiversity also being caused by fragmentation of the landscape? Um, so the challenge here is, or the, the main research gap, is that the relative importance of um, spatial and environmental processes is, is still relative, relatively unknown. 
And traditionally, researchers have looked to tackle this question using statistical um, algorithms um, that are limited by the extent to which they contain severe biases. So there's a new set of methods that are promising but uh, computationally very intensive. Um, a, model, um, a model that's uh, been, I, I don't know if Martin's group has developed this or if it's been developed elsewhere, I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, but this has been used to sample organis organisms from a particular species pool. Again, we're looking at a, a thousand times, so it's that idea of um, sampling in, in potentially relatively small chunks, but there's, there's a large number of chunks. And being able to ultimately quantify the, the spatialized environment. The benefit of having Proteus is that, um, as you may have guessed, this is allowing us to run much more samples over a much shorter time frame. Um, and the spatial analyses are possible at greater extents and at higher resolutions as well. So this is a um, work that's contributed to the paper um, published last year, led by um, Lee Brown in Leeds. Uh, and some of the work that Martin had published earlier this year is focused on um, the Mediterranean, looking at some of the dominant processes um, related to dispersal and spatial structure in the environment. Um, so moving on uh, to thinking about um, some, some things that have been looked at recently in geomorphology, Marco has kindly put together a a few slides and I'll do my best to, to explain the types of things that he's been working on. So Marco uses frequently these uh, landscape evolution models in order to simulate processes of um, change in the physical landscape. Um, but one issue here is that the simulated landscapes that may come out of our, um, our models, um, they're rarely compared uh, systematically with um, what we see in the, in the real world. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily compare the model with what we see in reality. Um, and the reason for, for not making this comparison, um, there's a lot of uncertainty there. We don't know, if we're running a simulation for the last 10,000 years, we don't know it, what the initial landscape may have looked like 10,000 years ago. We don't know what the, the weather has been doing for the last 10,000 years. Um, models are not getting things, um, they can't simulate everything, they're simplifications of reality. Uh, and find it difficult to deal with the random nature of nonlinear systems. So the challenge is to deal with these uncertainties or try and deal with them. Uh, so Mar Marco used the uh, Caesar landscape model, which he uh, was one of the primary developers of, to run simulations representing the last 3,000 years um, of landscape evolution in um, a study area in northeastern Spain. Um, so in order to maximize the capacity for sensitivity analysis and calibration, this has required running multiple simulations rather than just you know, one simulation and this is what happened. We need to have a range of possibilities. Um, so as I said, um, Proteus being there and, and the rest of the, of the modeling group, um, modeling individuals um, feeding their, their work and their analysis into the Moon machine has freed up the, the computational resources in the uh, numerical computation suite, and Marco can once again use these machines for what they were intended for in the first place, for doing landscape evolution modeling. Um, there's a number of key findings. I think Marco is in the process of, of um, writing a paper which should be ready for submission soon. Um, one of the key things that's found is the, the regolith layer, which I believe is the sort of uh, loose material across the, the bedrock. Um, this is a very important strain on, on the simulations and being able to better simulate this is, is going to give us improvements overall. Okay, um, so I'm going to finish by just talking about um, our ideas in the context of further development. So we fully intend that this system will continue to support numerical modelling at core in um, six different ways. The first is data storage. So this provision of fast storage, being able to transfer uh, and share particularly large data files. For, there to be, for, the, for those sorts of files to be centrally stored and centrally available is very important. 
Um, in terms of uh, complexity, sorry, um, there's real scope for uh, processes that are occurring at, at higher resolution, finer spatial and temporal resolution, to be represented in existing and potentially new models. The reason this hasn't been done in the past is, has been about um, uh, limitations of computational resources. So this has raised the bar. Um, in terms of capacity, I've talked a lot about being able to perform greater numbers of simulations, even if they're just really small um, statistical models or, or corrections. Very important for quantification of uncertainty. Uh, testing, we hope that this facility will be a platform to enable us to potentially develop larger models, which can then be uh, distributed to um, a really large national level supercomputer. So for instance, NERC um, have such facility um, applying for a NERC project, you might request time on this particular supercomputer. So we can do the testing stage here and then potentially full simulations um, on a larger cluster. Uh, collaboration, it's, it's great that we're now in a position where we have a facility that's um, similar in, in its infrastructure to um, the facilities that maybe exist in some of the institutes that we work closely with. Um, and then finally, recruitment as well. Um, I'd certainly like to think that this is a basis to continue to um, attract what we consider to be high quality research staff. Um, I mentioned before about this kind of modeling wheel. It's by no means um, exclusive. I would fully anticipate that over the course of time that we can add to our modeling expertise and, and um, add other fields or subfields that are our, of interest to us. Um, but that's about, that's about 45 minutes. That's what I was looking for. That's good. Um, so I'll leave it there then, just with a, a brief summary. I'll leave those notes on the, um, on the page. Uh, just to say, this machine, the facility, uh, our activities, this provides a basis for um, a lot of the data analysis that will take place in forthcoming PhD projects that are due to start in September 2019. Um, I haven't gone into detail about those, but um, yeah, both uh, exciting projects um, from my side anyway. Uh, and plenty of project proposals that are in review and either in review or in development that are citing this facility as an, as, a, as an important component in the research that we want to do. Thank you very much for coming. I hope that was interesting. <laughs>